welcome to the Psychology Podcast, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. I'm Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, and in each episode, I have a conversation with a guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. I have a few announcements I'd like to make before we dive into today's episode. First, I wanted to let you know that if you'd prefer an ad-free experience and would also like early access to new episodes, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. That's patreon.com slash psychpodcast for a completely ad-free experience and also early access to new episodes. Also, I wanted to let you know that my Transcend course is coming back in February. The next iteration of the course will offer even more ways to help you live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self-actualized life. There will only be 150 limited slots available, though, so you're going to want to save your spot as soon as possible. So you can go to transcendcourse.com to sign up. That's transcendcourse.com. Okay, now let's dive into today's episode. Today, it's great to chat with Stephen Kotler on the podcast. Stephen is a New York Times bestselling author an award-winning journalist, and the executive director of the Flow Research Collective. He is one of the world's leading experts on human performance. He's the author of nine bestsellers out of 13 books total, including The Art of Impossible, The Future is Faster Than You Think, Stealing Fire, The Rise of Superman, and Bold and Abundance. His work has been nominated for two Pulitzer Prizes, translated into over 40 languages, and appeared in over 100 publications, including the New York Times Magazine, Wired, Atlantic Monthly, Time, and the Harvard Business Review. Stephen is also the co-host of Flow Research Collective Radio. Along with his wife, author Joy Nicholson, he's the co-founder of the Rancho de Chihuahua Hospice and Special Needs Dog Sanctuary. Stephen, what a true pleasure this is going to be to chat with you today. God, it's great to be with you. This book that you've published, first of all, congratulations. In a lot of ways, would you say it's kind of like your magnum opus? Would that be fair to say that up to this point? Inadvertently, like I've been, th- you brought that up a while ago, a month, two months ago. You asked me a similar question, and I've literally been thinking about it ever since because it wasn't intentionally that book, but it is. There's 30 years of research. My all everything I've studied over the past, like in my entire professional career, it's in there. Is in, the, is in yeah. there. Yeah, and I didn't actually realize it until you when you said that because I think you used the word magnum opus or something like that. And I was sort of like stunned by that. I was like, really, huh? What's he looking at? And I looked and I was like, oh, crap, he's right. It's kind of right. How is it not is, is the question. Yeah, no, I, I, no, I actually think I actually think you're, you know, better or worse. Right. I, th- I think if you be a magnum opus, the, the world has to like it first or something like that. So that that's still debatable, I guess. It is 30 years of research, right? 30 years of psychology and neuroscience and, and, and my own, you know, weird weirdness turned into one thing. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, huge congratulations, and I wish it a, a great success. It, but just tracing the the development of your own thinking about this topic, because you you know you wrote about extreme sports, and then you you expanded and you you looked at everyone and how can everyone the person who's not trying to be an extreme sports athlete, but how in their daily life can they kind of get into that very similar flow state, right? And then this one is even broader than flow. It's it's high performance more broadly and all the many different facets and things that interweave with that. How has your own thinking on this topic changed? Your whole thinking on human potential, I would say most broadly, how has that changed since you first started writing about this topic? A good, hard question. So I th- when I think about what went into the argument possible, there are like three or four sort of developmental stages, problems I was trying to solve, questions I was trying to answer. One of them is was was because flow as a state of optimal performance amplifies motivation and grit and productivity and creativity and learn all these subcategories. I, if I wanted to be an expert in flow, I had to understand how did these things work and how do they relate to flow? And, you know, there's millions of experts in each of those subcategories. You're one of the world's leading experts on creativity. You've probably forgotten more about creativity than I'm ever going to know. But the one thing that I managed 
to notice is that when you're looking at all this stuff because it's flow and it captures all of it, you're like, oh, wow, it's all a system. It's a sequence. It's a process. Of course it is. We're biological organisms and all of these components are linked together and they're meant to work together and they're work, meant to work apparently by the science in a particular order, et cetera, et cetera. That was that took a really that's a weird perspective. And it took a while to sort of develop that I was at that all these components that tons of people were looking at and, and sort of writing books about, right? They're great books on focus and grit and flow and creativity and learn all that stuff, that they were all part of one system. That was it. That emerged over time was part one. And the second thing that emerged over time that was very complimentary was the idea that, you know, I, I've been training people in flow. And, and how to utilize flow for, for a lot of years, 20 years at this point, some very, very long period of time. And I've trained a tremendous amount of people. And flow is, you know, when you start with the neuroscience, it's kind of remarkably easy to train, but it is not that, that heightened amount of flow that you can get people in their life. It doesn't seem to be sustainable for everybody. And, you know, when, first of all, when you're, what you're doing is you're selling courses that will help people achieve more flow in your life and they're getting a bunch more flow. And then suddenly they start dropping out of flow like flies, you have very angry customers and, you know what I mean? Like frustrated people on top of everything else. And so I was looking at why is that the case? And I started to realize it was very, very clear that it's flow uh, is one part of it, but the whole puzzle is if you haven't trained up learning skills or creativity skills or the motivation skills or the grit skills or whatever the subcategories are, the stuff that flow is gonna amplify, even though flow will amplify them, you don't have a strong enough foundation to sustain the amplification. If you don't know how to learn, flow demands the challenge skills balance, that you you push your skills to the utmost constantly. To do that, that requires learning all the time. So you're learning and you're growing. If you don't have good foundational learning skills, for example, really basic stuff like you were not, you don't have a truth, the term I use is a truth filter. I My truth filter was journalism and investigative journalism. How do you find truth in there? Scientists have the scientific method. You know, Elon Musk talks about first principle thinking, but these are basically all ways of assessing information quickly. And so, you know, do I trust it? Do I, can, should I not trust it, right? And they facilitate rapid learning. If you don't have those kinds of skills, you, I can amplify flow all you want. You can't sustain the amplification. So that was the second realization is that you actually have to train all these things up at once if you really want the full turbo boost. And the third realization this was the last one coming was, and you I'm sure came to these same conclusions. And, and, and Maslow said years ago, as, as I'm sure you know, whatever one can be, one must be. And what he's talking about is exactly what showed up in the research. If you, for example, when you look at intrinsic motivation, right? The big five intrinsic motivators I talk about are curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery, right? Utilizing those gives you a huge boost in motivation, et cetera, et cetera, which you can use to go after high, hard goals to go big, right? That's the whole point of the book. But it turns out not going big, not trying to rise to our full potential is horrible for us, psychologically horrible for us. And this was what, this was, what was so shocking. I was looking at major causes of anxiety and depression, of which there are eight. And there are two that get all the attention, right? Genetics and trauma. And yet, if you look into the data, as you know, Genetics is like a 50% cause of depression. It's always genetics and something else. And in terms of trauma, occasionally trauma does lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, but the vast majority of the time, and most of us, trauma leads to post-traumatic growth, right? The world breaks everyone and many are stronger at the broken places. And that's what the research shows. But the other six causes of depression will give you one of the major ones, lack of meaningful work. And what is lack of meaningful work when you dig under the hood? It's work that you're not curious about, that you're not passionate about, that's not aligned with your purpose and your values, that you don't have autonomy to pursue your own interests in, and you don't have the opportunity for mastery, and it doesn't produce flow. That's what lack of meaningful work actually means in practice, right? And what that really means is lack of access to the neurobiological changes, curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery actually give you, right? That's really what we're talking about as the causes. And that was the most shocking sort of finding in the end. That was when the urgency for the book started to like sort of increase in my mind. I was like, oh, wow, this isn't just there isn't just a blueprint for how to go big. Not going big is bad for us. And 
I, maybe this has been widely known for a long time by a lot of people that I was the last to know. But like when I started, I remember the first time it, it, I was reading Lost Connections, uh, Hariri, sure. uh, right, about the eight major causes of depression. And that's where I, as I was reading it, and I, it was four or five years ago, I was like, wow, these look really familiar. He looks, everything I was reading, I was like, this is the inverse of exactly what I'm looking at on the peak performance side. And, you know, of course it is. We're one biological organism. That makes sense. But it was a kind of a shocking discovery in a sense. And I think those three lines of thinking are the lines of thinking that sort of led me in this direction. It was, of course, there's been phenomenal neuroscience done on all these topics now, too. And that's my thing. I want to take it. I love the psychology. I think the psychology is incredibly useful, but most of the time it's metaphorical. It's not the thing. It's not mechanism. And I'm, I, I think we can get to mechanism. Stuff becomes much more trainable which is my, my only point, trainable, useful, right? That's um, not better without worse, not a, you know, and I, but it, it, it does seem to be more trainable and that is what seems to matter. So like, yeah, those were the sort of big three insights. God, did I talk for a long time to answer that question? I apologize. <laughs> no, no problem. That, that those are great insights. Training, I feel like there's a lot of pressure to try to train flow because people are paying money and and they're expecting, you know, just get me into the flow state. I'm paying you money, so get me in the flow. And so I feel like there's got to be a lot of pressure to on you, you know, be like, well, okay. it's it does not that it doesn't work like that. You know, if it, I mean, that'd be great. That if that worked like that, then then the, all the top one percent billionaires would automatically be in flow more than. Yeah, exactly. I would. I would. I'd be out of a job. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There wouldn't be a need a, a need for me. But I will say. All this stuff, flow turned out to be a lot more reliable and repeatable than I think anybody suspected back in the 90s when we were trying to, like, if you look at Susan Jackson's work, Flow in Sports, for example, where there's a really good breakdown of her frustrations in trying to teach top athletes how to drop into flow. And, you know, the hit rate is, it's not great. And yet we're using the same exact tool she was using to measure flow pre and post. And we're seeing reliably on the back end of our trainings, like a 70% boost in flow. And I don't think it's that our Kung Fu is so badass. It's that things have gotten down to the neurobiology and biology scales, right? It's shared between all of us. Evolution shaped us all this way. And you get down to that level. I think it, it's much more effective for all kinds of people. I'd like to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? For quite a lot of us right now during this coronavirus pandemic, we are struggling with our most fundamental basic needs, such as our needs for security, connection, and opportunities to master our work. I think all of us could use some therapy right now. I know I sure could, which is why I've really been enjoying working with a professional therapist at BetterHelp so I can realize the best version of myself even under the current circumstances. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating with your therapist in just under 48 hours. Note that it's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There is a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. In fact, the service is available for clients worldwide. What I really like about BetterHelp is that you can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as you often have to do with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is really committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. Here's a recent one. Camilla helped me turn my life around. Everything has been so positive for me since our first session. Deep gratitude. I'm pleased to announce a special offer for listeners of the Psychology Podcast. You can get 10% off your first month of professional counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash psychpodcast. That's better H E L P slash psych podcast. Join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. 
Okay, now back to the show. Well, you know, in your book, you say biology scales, personality doesn't. What does that catchphrase mean? It's a Stephen Kotler catchphrase. I love yeah, it. it's a Stephen Kotler catchphrase, I guess. You've got a lot of those. You've got a lot of those. And I quote them. I, I, you have another one. Flow is the most addictive thing in the world. You know, I, I love your catchphrases. But yeah, explain that one. I can go longer on this, but let me give you the short version. You can, you can poke at it however you want. Really, really often in, in peak performance and coaching, very much when you start moving into this self-help, you know, the sort of the less science-based stuff, what you, you see is <laughs> people figure out what works for themselves and they try to teach it to other people. And as a general rule, it doesn't work. And I learned this lesson the real hard way, but as a general rule, it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is personality has a huge influence on how any person should approach peak performance. For example, where you are on the introversion to extroversion scale, or what are your risk tolerances? Those are huge, important foundational questions. And they're created, those are personality questions, right? Your risk tolerances, these are genetically hardwired and or established by really early childhood experience. Now, the research says you can change them. You can become more risk friendly, risk tolerant, over, but it is a, it's like trying to change a character trait. You can do it. We didn't used to think we could. Now we know you can, but it seems to be very, very slow. Takes a long time, doesn't happen easily. So for example, my early career as a journalist and especially covering action sports and other things I was covering in, in both journalism and action sports for the people I was around, if you were not literally nearly dying once a month or something like that, you weren't doing your job. That was just a typical, normal day in the life of this. And this was almost everybody I knew. I thought this was normal. My risk tolerances are crazy. So when I learned a little bit about flow and peak performance and got cocky and, you know, I, I like people believe me. I, had a, I was writing for a blog for Psychology Today. I had books on the New York Times. You know, people believe me. And I was trying to teach people this is what worked for me. Do this, do this, do this. I put a guy in the hospital. I nearly caused a divorce. I, one of my friends still isn't talking to me. It's been 20 years. Like it was, a, I mean, a mess of people's lives. And I was really, I was like, what the hell went wrong? Because this stuff, I knew this stuff works so well. And that was where that insight sort of came from. I was like, whoa, personality. There's too much stuff that is individual that affects how you make foundational peak performance decisions. That's individual. You can't, I, what works for me is not going to work for you. You can't train it that way. It's dangerous. It's not helpful to the people you're teaching. Biology, if you get things down to, hey, there are seven foundational emotional systems. They're found in all mammals, including humans. They work this way. They have each neuro, different neurotransmitters, different networks in the brain, et cetera, et cetera. When that is conserved among not just all humans, but all species. So when you take things to that level, you can be sure it's going to work for everybody because it's shared, it's conserved, it's not altered by early childhood experience and you know individual genetics and things like that. So that's what I mean by personality doesn't scale and biology scales. Gotcha. Yeah, and I, I like that you you uh, acknowledge that personality traits really do make a difference in in terms of this. And I've been thinking about the role of personality differences and the extent to which things are possible for you. And it seems like confidence is a big one. And I feel like confidence or self-efficacy needs to be earned in order to be most effective. At least you need to have some sense that you're capable. I'm so Yeah. I'm so glad you said this. So I've been, uh, this is, you're talking about it in confidence, but it's also true in grit. So in trying to train people to be gritty, there's actually two stages to the process. There's first, you have to go out and let's say it's physical grit, right? You're trying to get grittier physically. Um, which, by the way, the research says is, is if you want to be grittier cognitively or emotionally or whatever, start physically. Um, it, it's the one skill that it does seem that training it physically first work, helps. But first, you have to push a little bit harder today on your workout, and then you have to do it again tomorrow, and then you have to do it the day after and the day after. And the, you have to do the actual work. That's not even the issue. The issue is you yourself have to trust yourself to do the work, meaning you're, you're, there's a set, there's a gap, right? You don't, it's not just, I'm gritty enough to do it. It's, I have the confidence in my grit so that I know going into any situation, I've got this extra in the tank, right? That is so, and it's tricky because it's a different thing. 
I'll give you a simple example uh, from, again, physical, but this is a, this is a, a different, if you break a bone, if you're an action sport athlete and you break a bone, it's really common. The recovery may take six months to six months to nine months from the broken bone, but psychologically, your body will govern will put governor on a, on your ability to, to move at speed or to go full out. It'll take about a year, year and a half to get over this the unconscious governor on your behavior that your that your brain is layering in because your brain no longer trusts you to operate at high at that speed without damaging the vessel kind of thing. And you have to re-earn the trust of the adaptive unconscious in a sense, which is an odd thing, but it seems to be very true. Re-earn the trust of the cognitive unconscious. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point. And Maslow talked a lot of, sometimes about that mismatch between conscious self-esteem and unconscious self-esteem. I mean, what if you have this conscious sort of confidence and posturing, but you feel in your gut like you're an imposter? That's got to be a mismatch you need to reconcile psychoanalytically, right? It was funny. I was talking to a good friend of mine this morning, and he is literally one of the toughest martial artists on the planet. Literally, like widely acknowledged, one of the toughest martial artists on the planet. He's uh, having difficulties in his relationship, and we were talking about it. And we were talking about the fact that it doesn't literally matter that he's one of the toughest guys on the planet. When he gets in a fight with his girlfriend, he's the you know the five year old kid who got bullied at home and bullied at school, and he became one of the toughest guys on the planet in reaction to that. But when he's in that argument, he doesn't feel like a super powerful human being, which he literally is by any like any clear measurement device. He's literally a five year old kid, and we all like we know this. This is that you know Navy SEAL, that famous Greek saying that the Navy SEALs live by, which is we don't rise to the level of occasion, we sink to the level of our training. And it's because what, you know what I mean, I turn up the norepinephrine in your brain, I make you more fearful, more anxious, your brain goes, oh, problem, I want simple solutions. What what worked back when I was five? Okay, let's go for that. And that's essentially what we're up against, right? And that's what we're trying to like, so when you talk about confidence, it's not all the stuff you build on top of the like the like broken structure that you started with, it's literally you got to fix the broken structure you started with because that's the ultimate weak link in the chain. I love that story with the martial artist. I just love that. It was a really crazy. I mean, you know, we were laughing about. It. I've known this guy forever, but he's like, he's like, dude, Google me. People are scared of me, and yet you know, I was like, I know. So, what is the difference between lower lower I impossible and capital I impossible? Great question. My whole career has been spent essentially studying those moments in time when people accomplished capital on impossible. They did what that which has never been done. I did this in, in action sports. We've been talking about that. But I, you know, in for Wired, the New York Times magazine, all, a lot of those magazines you listed, my beat was be in the room when sci-fi ideas become science fact technology, when the first world's first artificial vision implant is turned on, the very first blind person gets to see again, when the first private spaceship leaves Earth, the thing that NASA and said was impossible, et cetera, et cetera. I was in all those rooms trying to figure out, hey, how the hell is this possible, right? That was, that was sort of what I was doing, and that's capital I impossible, that which has never been done. And it turns out that I didn't meet anybody who set out to accomplish capital I impossible, right? Everybody I met set out to accomplish what I call small I impossible. And that's what art impossible was really about. Small I impossible is that which we think is impossible for ourselves, right? The end, the end of our expectations for ourselves. Wait, where's our limit? At? And this could be growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, man. I wanted to be a writer when I was five years old. Cleveland, Ohio was a blue collar steel mill town. I didn't know any writers. I didn't know how you became a writer. I didn't like other than like putting words together. I could barely even spell. You know what I mean? Like I didn't have. I had no clue. It was a small line possible. Why? Because there's no clear path between point A and point B. And statistically, crap odds is success, right? What is another small line possible? Rising out of poverty, overcoming deep trauma, beginning becoming world class at anything you do, getting paid for what you love. In fact, I think the first small I impossible, the longer I've thought about it, I think the first small I impossible, and I think almost everybody solves this one, is getting a first kiss. Do you remember back when you were like 11 or 12 and you just discovered, you know, 
that there were attractive people in the world that you might be interested in. And you were like, oh, my God, how do I what do I I mean, like, that's the that's how small I am possible. How the hell do I do this thing that matters so much to me? Right. That's a small I am possible. And the thing that I found over and over and over again, and I'll give you a, a story that ampl- exemplifies this in a second, but is that. The only way you get to capital I impossible is small I impossible after small I impossible after small I impossible. In fact, when you get to capital I impossible, often for the person on the inside doing it, they don't even notice. To them, it's just what's next. They're just having breakfast. They're doing the thing that's in front of them. It's everybody else who's looking at it and going, no way, man. And here's the classic story about this. Is yeah, Part of the action sports story, I know it's a psychology podcast, but I think this is a great one. The very first time I talked to Laird Hamilton, I met him. He was 33. I was 27. He was just starting to tow into Jaws. So at that point, he was sort of the widely acknowledged toughest guy on the planet doing the most impossible thing anybody had ever seen, towing into these monster waves. And I remember talking to him about it. He said, Stephen, you know, the funniest thing about this is people look at me and they see me on a 50 foot wave and they think, oh, my God, Laird, that that is just it's impossible. There's no way I could never do that. It's totally impossible. Like, yeah, they're looking at me. I'm 33 years old. They see me on this 50 foot wave. They think it's impossible. They didn't see me at three years old on a three foot wave. They didn't see me at four on a four foot wave. They didn't see me at five on a five foot wave. And they didn't see me last week on a 49 and a half foot wave. So they see the 50 foot wave and think, oh my God, how do you do that? And I think, well, Laird, I don't know, six inches more than you did last week. Maybe you're not pushing hard enough. That's what it's like on the inside versus all on the outside. And that's what I kept finding over and over and over again. And it'd be really odd, like you, people would accomplish the impossible and some of them wouldn't even notice. You know what I mean? Like growing up in this action sports community, or not growing up, but reporting on it, it's one thing when you see impossible on TV, when you see, or you hear about it, you read about it. It's another thing when you go drinking with somebody on Friday night, and then you get up Saturday morning and go out into the mountains and they do something that for all of recorded history has never been done and is not supposed to ever be done. That's a very, that's not some dude on a screen, that's just the guy you were out with the night before. That demands a totally different kind of explanation. You know what I mean? That's no longer, oh my God, you're like, it's sort of in your face in a way that is really like, it's a visceral puzzle. You're like, oh my God, how, is, how does that happen? It's a, and that's a, so that, there was a different kind of experience of it also. It's cool, man. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how do you, like, what, what have you failed at in your life? Oh my God. So let's just talk about the experience of writing. Cause I often think about this. I think the experience of writing a book is almost constant failure. Cause you write something today, you think it's awesome. You come back tomorrow and you're like, Oh crap, it's not as good as I thought it was. Let me fix it. And you fix it. And then you write something else and you think, Oh, this is, I got it. I nailed it. And come back the next day and you're like, Oh, this, this is just crap. I, I didn't do my job. Oh, let me fix that. I think Writing a book is, I mean, I've, I can give you a long list of things that I failed at, but I really think that almost any creative project is the experience of disappointing yourself over and over and over again. And you get it right, but you get it right at the very end. And you know, it's not a real right. You know, you're just, you're like, okay, it's done. And I'm not going to look at it for a while. I'm going to turn it in. But you know, if you came back in three months, it wouldn't be done. It wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be finished because that's the nature of a creative, being a creative project, that little dissatisfied itch. So I think failure in, in, in any serious creative life is constant. And I think the same thing is true in any, um, you know, I'm not a scientist PhD by training, but I do science research all the time. And I think science research is also that. Like how many things did you think were absolutely true that you later, some of them, you yourself proved yourself wrong. You know what I mean? It's, these are both very like humbling. You must sort of look at your failures all the time professions. So, I mean, I've failed on so many, so many different, like what haven't I failed at is, is a better question. Your, how many best-selling books you didn't fail on Ag- those? Agreed. Agreed. But I've like, I've had books that have vanished into the ether as, as well, right? Like all that stuff. You know, we, we all have. Um, I've had magazine articles that I spent a year working on that got killed at the last minute. You know, that's a, that's a crazy thing. You put a year of your life into something and something happens in the news and something like, you know, the story gets shut down. I mean, over and over and over again. I just don't, 
I'm very resilient in that, like, whatever you do to me, I'm going to wake up the next day and I'm going to try to take whatever that crap feeling is and I'm going to try to turn it into words. I'm going to do something. How I process pain and anything is by turning it into words, right? And turning it into art. So I say this in, in, in Art of Impossible. I think it's really true. Anybody who's accomplished anything really hard in this life, your passion is your salvation, right? It's where you run to when you need to run. So the good, like, I think my life has been chock-a-block with failure. And so, I, by, and by the way, I always say every successful person I've ever met is running away from something just as fast as they're running towards something. And that double motivation is really important. Fear's a great, great, great phenomenal driver. It doesn't feel very good, but it's a great motivator. And so if you can work with it, you can get farther faster for a, a lot of reasons, right? You get fear gives us focus for free. I always create, like, whenever I write a book, I always have a writing problem in the book that scares me. I'm always doing, going after, like, it's not visible to anybody, you know, from the outside. You would never know it was a challenge I set for myself, but it's, just, it's something that scares me because I know I'm going to have a little more focus every time I go to write because it, it scares me a little. Well, it seems like with you, you, ha you pair fear with the confidence to still act or the, or the bravery, shall we say, to still act. I wouldn't say that fear in itself itself is a great motivator. It usually makes people avoid things unless it's paired also with this additional thing. Confidence to act like or bravery. What I, yeah. So I, I like it's interesting because I've had a lot of conversations in and around bravery. Also, bravery is literally you do it in spite of how it feels. Right. Right. I used to think when I was younger that like courage and bravery meant like the, you didn't feel the fear. Like I was like, God, I don't have any courage. I'm not brave. I'm, I'm terrified all the time. And it turns out, no, actually, bravery, courage is just about feeling it and doing it anyways. And I'm really good at that. And the only reason I'm really good at that is because I discovered very early on in my career, uh, very, in my life, that on the other side of, of my fear are all the stuff I want, all like the, all the great joys, all of my superpowers, all of that stuff is on the other side of the fear. That's what I know. So I know that like, no matter how awful it feels and how awful it feels to go right at it, and it's never easy and I have no confidence. I have zero, I have very little confidence going into a lot of that stuff. All I know is that to get to where I wanna go, I gotta go in this direction. I look at fear as a great gift from the universe. I love that. Next, I, the way I talked about it, I've talked about it before, is fear's a compass to me. And I think it's a compass to most top performers. And it's, it's for this reason, you just sort of figure out, you're like, oh, it feels terrible, but the thing I really, thing I want most is on the other side of this. So I gotta, there's no, there's no actual choice, right? Because the running away from it, the shame to me is totally unbearable. The fact that I like can't like didn't go at the thing. I don't like if I fail, I fail. But if I didn't go at it and I chose to live with that awful feeling, that is really difficult for me. That's I, I don't think it's confidence. I think it's that I think living with the fear and the shame is worse. And I know the things I want are on the other side of my fear. This is great. Those two things together. It makes a lot of sense. You know, in a lot of ways, a lot of that comes down to like vision, you know, like imagination. You can clearly see what's on the other side. I don't know. I think there's people differ in their clarity of vision. So it seems it's a little bit that's what you're talking about is clarity of vision. And that is, and I think that's a muscle, by the way. I just want to, the thing I want to point out with, with vision, right? And I, I think you'd agree with me on this is it's, you know, imagination, whatever we want to call it, creativity, it's a muscle. And you have to, you train yourself to see a little farther out, right? See? I know you've been getting fuerte. I, I, I know about your workout regimen. You know, I know who I work out I, with. I know who your coach is. I do. And she, she's mean. She's mean. Um, in a good way. But the other, she's showing me what's the other side of fear. Yes. And it's really true, right? You start pushing through those things. And that's the great. I mean, one of the great lessons of action sports also is it's an environment that forces you to confront really basic fears, speed, 
the body doesn't like going above certain speeds because bad things happen. You know what I mean? And et cetera, et cetera, you're up against primal forces, but in a sort of controlled environment. Like you don't get to control everything, but you can sort of can you can dose it, right? You can say, okay, I can expose myself to this much, this much, and this much. And that's, you know, there's a whole big chapter in Art of Impossible on here's, you know, how you go at risk and learn how to work with fear and things like that. I also tell people, you don't want to start here. You don't want, like, there are five layers, six layers of grit that peak performers try to train. Fear is like the fifth one in that I think people really start to work with because you do want the confidence, right? You're starting, you point it to your muscles, right? You want to, if you're training grit in this kind of stuff, you want to start with the physical stuff, very simple, basic physical stuff because we're physical embodied organisms and somehow the brain seems to trust that process a little bit more and in a, you know, in a weird way. So, oh, wow, I've got physical grit. Okay. Now I can start to develop cognitive grit and then you can sort of move from there. And I think fear is something you're going to have to work with it and negotiate it along the way. But there's a point at which you're like, okay, now I've got enough stuff in there to really start training fear. I think if you just jump right in and try to go head on at it, I think it's difficult for most people. I couldn't do it. I don't, I, I know very few people every now and again, you meet like a Navy SEAL guy or an action sports person where you're like, Oh wow, you can just go right at that. I don't like that's super rare in my experience. And that's a personality thing. Not personality doesn't scale. I don't think that's a biological thing. Right. Um, bold boldness. It's a facet of psychopathy. <laughs> And it, right, and it also means your D2 receptors are hella active and, you know, we can go on from there. Yeah, you like really getting it under the hood, don't you? You know I do. Yeah, no, I know. I'm, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, you like that. Um, I do. You know, you, your discussion of grit in your book is really quite unique. You link things like mindfulness to grit. And, uh, and you also talk about the dark side of grit. You know, can you just can you talk about some of this? Because because I think in a lot of discussions of grit, you know, a lot of these things aren't really discussed. People seem to think of grit as strictly like what we would call perseverance, right? And or industriousness, industriousness, and they don't like as resilience, for example, is a major component in grit, and resilience has very little to do with industrialness and the, the, you know what I mean? Like resilience is a totally different category of thing. And so what I always say is the first grit skill you have, you have to, is, it, you've got to come in through the body as we've been talking about. And I'm not, I'm very wary. There's a lot of like the in, people who, who are really into embodied cognition and share the inactive vis, vision of perception really tend, there, there's a body chauvinism that's sort of floating around, especially in the the performance world and the coaching world, you hear a lot like, don't even bother, worry about the mind. Everything's through the body. I just think that's idiotic. Like, I'm a very cognitive dude. You want to teach me anything, you've got to come in through my brain. You Like, coming in through my body is a recipe for disaster, except with this grit skill. So I'm just saying that. But the second thing I, I you have to train is the grit to control your thoughts. Absolutely. It's the second grit skill. Because if you if thought without thought control, as we both know the default mode network, what you call the imagination network brilliantly, is a wonderful ally, provided you can get a grip on negative self-rumination. If you can't get a grip on negative self-rumination, your default mode network is going to kill you, literally, right? It is literally going to drive you mad. It is the, it is the thing that will drive you mad. So... I want to teach you to be creative later on in the book, right? That's where it, it goes. I have to teach you to utilize your default mode network because, as you know, that's how a lot of creativity is going to get done. But I can't teach you that until you have basic thought control skills. If you're still taking every one of your thoughts personally, if you've got no separation between, you know, what, what you could call emotion and feeling right? Emotion, the, the internal signal and feeling the actual, oh, I, this is sadness or whatever. You can't get into that gap. You're going to believe every one of your thoughts is, is real, is true, is accurate. And your brain's going to kick your ass over time, especially if you're trying to go after high hard challenges, which is what the art of impossible is about. Why? They're high hard challenges. 
there, I just talked about writing a book as a constant experience of failure. You're wrong almost every day. You fail a little bit almost every day and you, you get back up and you put more into it. And at the end, you like the high hard goal. A lot of people want to write a book. That's a, that's a very common high hard goal. And yet the experience is one of constant failure. If I couldn't control my thoughts when I got to the realization every morning that the thing I wrote yesterday that I thought was perfect is actually crappy and I'm going to have to spend the next two hours rewriting it, that requires, right, it's going to require grit, persistence, like I got to do the work. But if I can't control my thoughts, if I take it personally, if I think I'm a bad person, if I think I'm stupid, if I think I'm a failure, then I've got two problems, right? My bad writing that's going to require I got to lead it and my bad head. So I don't, with grit skills, so little of it seems to be about the physical perseverance stuff that people so associated with and so much with that. And a lot of the later grit skills, like the grit to be your best when you're at your worst. And this was really one that was first pointed out to me. I got to give credit where credit was due. Josh Waitskin was the one who identified this really clearly for me. He was, we were talking about all the different grit skills that people should train. He's like the most important one, in my opinion. And that you also have to train it independently. And you do. And what you have to, it's a confidence thing. Like you literally have to create terrible conditions in your life and perform well in those terrible conditions. So you have the trust, the confidence that when those conditions show up, you can kick ass, right? And it's a different kind of muscle. It's a different kind of confidence. Is that a physical skill or a mental skill? I'll give you an example of my own life. When I'm trying to learn a speech, because I don't like, I'm good at this stuff, but I'm good at it because I practice a lot because I'm actually, I'm, I'm not that good at it. I'm normally intimidated in a lot of public speaking situations and things like that. And I, the reason I'm confident is because I practice like mad and I will write a speech. I will do my speech. I will do my speech in front of friends. I will practice and practice. And then I'll find a day where I didn't get enough sleep the night before. I have worked all day. I'll go to the gym. I'll work out. I'll come home. I'll grab my dogs and I'll go up the mountain behind my house and I'll give the speech. I'm exhausted. I usually try to do it when I haven't eaten. I feel terrible, my, right? Like no blow chug. My brain is not working. And if I can give the speech going up a mountain, then I can give the speech under any conditions, which is good because I, in my speaking career, there have been four or five or six times, colossally important, big rooms, lots of live bodies, lots of consequences, and things have gone horribly wrong, horribly wrong. AV systems have crashed, flies have gone away. I'm, you know, I, there's no microphone anymore. I'm shouting, you know, blah, blah, blah. All those kinds of things happen all the time or I'm desperately ill and, you know, was up all the night before because there was some crying infant in the room next to me. You know what I mean? Like whatever it was, those are tough conditions to be on stage in. And yet I need to know I can constantly deliver. So I, you got to train that muscle independently because it's the confidence that you're training. You're not just training the grit to do it. The grit to do it is, it's, it's one thing to know that you can do it. It's another thing to know that you've done it regularly and you have the confidence that when the stuff shows up in, in the real world, it's a skill you can rely on. Love it. May I add a uh, grit uh, facet to yeah, all, yeah, of, please. all of this? Let me know what you think of this. Try it, try it on. Uh, try it on the t-shirt and let me know if it fits. So uh, Paul Tillich, one of my favorite philosophers of religion, who uh, Maslow and the humanistic psychologist drew a lot on, wrote a really good book, The Courage to Be. Could we add, like, the grit to be? And, and what does that mean? What do I mean by that? I mean, the, in a lot of ways, it's, the, it, it's overcoming the fear of death. It's overcoming the, the uh, non-existence. You know, the idea of the fear of not mattering. These sort of things. It's a very, this is more of an existential grit. I just coined that on the spot, but do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, what I'm, what I'm wondering is because the, the order of the book and the, the, the way the biology seems to set up is you want to sort of start with curiosity and go into passion, go into purpose, right? And you get to the grit skills later. And my, my question is, because I agree with what you just said very much, and I'm wondering, does that sort of get covered when you're figuring out what your passion is and your, what your purpose is? Like, isn't that what we use to fight back against the existential dread? Isn't like, isn't passion or purpose in a sense, the grit to be 
And maybe I'm wrong there. I could like I have no I, I think you made a great point. I think you're right. And I'm just trying to, like, expand on it a little bit. Cool. You yeah, know, I love your, your yes ending as they do in improv yes. theater. I don't think it's exactly the same thing, but I'm happy. But I'd like to talk about I want to make sure I talk about passion. You're, you're the star of this show today. So uh, any of my you know, ideas I have, we can table for a second because I do want to hear your ideas about passion. Because you make a really good point in your book that passion is not an overnight process. And you actually like to conceptualize it more as pursuing a few of your intersecting curiosities. So that seems like a lot more manageable way for people to cultivate passion than just the idea of follow your passion that you hear a lot, right? Yeah, I think people get killed in this. Yeah, and you can send listeners. So we took that portion of the book. We made a really cool interactive PDF out of it. And it's passionrecipe.com. So oh, nice. anybody can go use that. That's out there. It's free. It's for everybody. But yeah, you know, let me big picture it before we even get into the nitty gritty, because this is such a mistake that people make. And it just it's an awful feeling on the inside. But when I you know, they everybody wants passion these days. It's big. It's mystical. And um, it's they true. don't even know why they want it. Right. Like and the, I mean, why? Why does passion matter? Because it gives you focus for free. Passion is nothing more neurochemically, this is Helen Fisher's work, not my work, than dopamine and norepinephrine. It's focus, it's attention, it's excitement, it's engagement, the desire to make meaning. That's what passion is, right, neurochemically. Romantic and it, what does it passion. give us? It gives us focus for free. Well, it, that's just passion in general. That's any, that's passion of an artist, that's romantic passion, that's just passion. By the way, curiosity is a little bit of norepinephrine and a little bit of dopamine, right? When you say, you know, you stacking curiosity to turn it into passion, all you're doing is really turning up the juice. But all this is besides the point that I wanted to make, which is when people think about passion, if I say, give me an example of athletic passion or something like that, you, you talk to me about LeBron James windmilling in for a dunk over some hapless defender in the finals and right in the fourth quarter, he's exhausted, there's sweat dripping off him. That's pathletic passion. And you're right. But it's late stage passion. Passion on the front end does not look or feel at all like passion on the back end. That kind of warrior passion that you're looking at saying, I want that, that is a slow build over very long periods of time to get to there. You got to remember that passion on the front end for that windmill dunk is just a little kid in a driveway shooting a basketball through a hoop trying to get it to fall. That's what it looks like on the front end. And so we mistake when we're at the front of our journey towards our passion, we mistake what we think we're not feeling on the inside for what we're looking at on the outside and saying, it's going to feel like that looks. And no, not, it, it will never feel like that looks on the front end of it. It, it literally can't. You embody passion on the back end. <laughs> no, on the, on the, and uh, I don't, that's late not the stage, term I late meant. Stage late stage. That's what I'm yeah, trying to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at you now. I bring up some things and then you go, oh, that remind that to me, that's passion, right? But that's Agreed. that, but you put in the work. That's the end stage. That's the end stage. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, in the beginning, I mean, literally neurobiologically, it does appear that passion is just nothing more than the intersection of multiple curiosities. And what you want to do is you want to find a thing you're curious about. Find another thing you're curious about. Where do they intersect? I'm really interested in football. I'm really interested in food. Okay, great. Football is up. Uh, what are the nutritional requirements for football? Let's play around there for a while. That's the intersection, right? Maybe there's something there and you just play there for a little while. Where does that connect with something else you're passionate about? This, and the reason is simply that curiosity on its own is a powerful motivator, but it's not powerful enough. It won't endure over time enough, right? If you can play at the intersection of multiple curiosities, two or three or four things that you really care about, and you put in the work to play there properly. When I say play, I literally mean play, like go out, talk about it. You want those social bonding neurochemicals underneath it. You know, there's a whole bunch of that stuff sort of broken down in the book. But there's a very specific recipe for sort of cultivating passion, but you don't want to mystify it. Passion matters because it gives us focus for free. You can pay attention with less energy. That's why passion matters. Why does purpose matter? You get more focus for free than you do for passion. 
right? And you also purpose, which brings in a cause greater than yourself, gets the focus off yourself, which as you know, if you're interested in flow, you can't have too much prefrontal cortex ego engagement going on to really drive a lot of flow that gets in the way. So purpose puts the, it expands your focus. It, it, you go from an egocentric focus to like a task specific focus much more easily when it's purpose is involved. These are, you know, really, they, they sound like purpose sounds like this. I want a purpose and it sounds really selfless, right? You hear it a lot today. Oh, I, 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 but from a peak performance perspective, it's totally selfish. Having a purpose is unbelievably selfish. Yes, it is great for the world to have a purpose. But from a peak performance perspective, you're getting so much focus for free, so many reward chemicals that drive productivity and performance for free. That's, the, that's sort of the point, in a sense, which is, you know, you could, it could be good for you and good for the world at the same time. That's okay, too. Synergy. Right. I'd like to take a moment to talk about one of our sponsors, Helix Sleep. Are you not able to sleep lately because of stress and anxiety? It's definitely understandable given the current state of the world. Psychological research shows that high quality sleep is so important for stress and well-being, and your choice of mattress really can matter a lot. In the past few years, I've been on a search for the perfect mattress, and let me tell you, I've gone through so many mattresses. I had no idea what it feels like to be well rested until I tried a Helix mattress. Helix Sleep makes personalized mattresses right here in America and ships them straight to your door with free no contact delivery, free returns, and a 100 night sleep trial. To choose a mattress, Helix made a quiz that takes just 2 minutes to complete and matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. If you like a mattress that's really soft or firm, you sleep on your side or your back or your stomach, or you sleep really hot, with Helix there's a specific mattress for each and everybody's unique taste. I took the quiz and I was matched with the Helix Sunset Lux because I wanted something that felt soft and I sleep mostly on my side at night. I've got to say I love my Helix mattress. I wake up with zero back pain and zero neck pain, which happened to me a lot before. I wake up really feeling refreshed and ready to work out or start my work. I really do love Helix, but you don't have to take my word for it. Helix was awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ, Wired Magazine, and Apartment Therapy. Just go to helixsleep.com psychology, take their two minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10 year warranty and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you probably will. Right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com psychology. Get up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash psychology. That's helixsleep.com slash psychology. Okay, sleep well, and let's get back to the show. So I just want to conclude today's episode with a question for you. Stephen, what are the three things that people can do to be a high performer? <laughs> oh, I've been set up. Um, I set you up. I set you all up. right. Scott, well, here's my thing on that one. I was, you have a, you know, Stephen has a bit of a bee in his bonnet. Over I, this I got a bee in my bonnet. It's not, so it's, it's that, you know, when this happens a lot, when, when, I, when I give a speech, somebody stands up afterwards invariably and they ask, what are the three things I can do Monday morning? And I usually answer in, um, shall we say, colorful language. Um, I usually apologize before I use the colorful language, and then I use the colorful language, and then I explain why. And, and, the, and the reason is this. Peak performance, it's not crazy, right? By the time you get to the art of, the end of the art of Bosman, if you look at it, peak performance is roughly about six things to do every day, seven things to do every week. And they vary a little bit. And they're not very long things to do. You know, and one of the things you might want to, you need to regulate your nervous system on a daily basis. That means either mindfulness, gratitude, or exercise. So, right, gratitude is a five-minute gratitude practice. So that's not a big thing to do. That's what I mean. But it's every day. Right. It's not. That's why there's no three things you can do Monday morning. 
because it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, repeat, because the real benefits, the benefits we all want, if you're just patient with yourself and show up and just you do the work, don't worry about the outcomes. Your job is to do the work, do a gratitude practice today, do a, you know what I mean? Like literally do, do, do the work. Don't care about the outcome. Just you do it every day over and over and over again, two, three, four months in these it's exponential growth, right? So you get these doublings and the early doublings are almost invisible, but suddenly you're like, Oh my God, I'll give you a really simple, let me, let me give you a slightly longer answer that makes this really clear. In the book, I talk about something called the habit of ferocity. This is essentially the ability to lean into challenges. Roar. Roar. To lean into challenges instinctively and automatically. And it's what I see in peak performers after they sort of properly cultivate all your intrinsic motivation. There's layer in some goal setting, some grit skills. You get this, it just sort of happens. And I always say with the habit of ferocity, what's the big deal? What does this matter? What is this habit of ferocity? Most people... When they encounter a challenge, something that's hard, a problem to solve, whatever, even if it's something they have a work thing where they, they got to do it, they're going to bitch about it for five minutes. They're just going to be like, oh, God, I don't want to do this. I'm going to freak, blah, blah, And it's only five minutes. But on any given work day or whatever, I encounter about five of those, right? And so if you've got the habit of ferocity and you're just leaning in automatically, the challenge rises up and you lean in sort of before you even think you have time to you think about it, you're just in the problem solving it. Say five minutes problem, it's 25 minutes a day, it's three and a half hours a week, three and a half weeks a year. That's what you get back. That's what I mean by compound interest. Like people look at peak performers and they're like, they're so far ahead of me. How did they get so far ahead? They got so far ahead, literally like five minutes at a time. It's not some giant leap. It's not some miracle. It's literally, they've lined up their intrinsic motivators, they've properly set their goals, they've just got a little more fire, more internal neurochemistry, through very, very doable, easy processes. And as a result, when the challenge rises up, they just lean in to meet it, and they don't dither around. And the results over a year is you're going to get a month of time back. That's considerable. And that's just one little thing. Right. That's what I mean by compound interest. Are you going to notice it in any given day? Oh, I say five minutes. You know what I mean? You don't, but you notice it when you're three weeks ahead. I hear you. The uh, sociologist Daniel Chambliss wrote a really cool article, The Mundanity of Excellence, looking at Olympic sports people. And he said it's really like, quite mundane when you follow their process over a long period of time. But of course, it doesn't, that doesn't mean talent doesn't matter. Maybe it's a necessary, but not sufficient. I, you know, you know my feeling. I, I, you and I, I think sure. I think everybody's great at something. I really do. I mean, yes, I talent think matters, so. but I think everybody's great at something. I think it may be could hard be to great. figure out. Could be great. Could be great. At, yeah, I think you, that's the correct phrase. So, yeah, I mean, talent is a thing, but you know. Both you and I were guys who coming up, people thought we were way behind the curve, right? They didn't think we were out. You too? They, they thought we were behind yeah. the curve. You I too, wasn't in, I wasn't in the same class as you, you were in. You were in special ed. But I, I wasn't in <laughs> yeah. special ed, but I had a sixth grade teacher who told me I wouldn't live to see 30. I had, you know, I had a bunch of, you know, wow. get kicked out of school kind of stuff. So I had that stuff. We seemed out, you know what I mean? Like oh, everybody's yeah. great at something. You figure it out. Oh, Steven. You give me chills, man, because I've been told many times as a child that it would be impossible to go to even college. Right. Talk about the art of impossible. I got a PhD from Yale. So clearly your theory and research and art and all this, it means something and it can inspire a lot of people. So thanks, Stephen, so much for being on the show today. And I wish you all the best with the, the book tour. Thank you, Scott. It's been great hanging out with you. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, please add a rating and review of the podcast on iTunes and subscribe to the Psychology Podcast YouTube channel as we're really trying to increase our viewership on YouTube. In fact, many of these episodes are in video format on YouTube. 
so you'll definitely want to check out that channel. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the podcast, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.